Well, thank you very much for that um, slightly flattering uh, uh, introduction. Um, it's good to see so many new faces. It's also very good to see a number of old faces. We have in the audience the man who uh, interviewed me for my job at SRI 33 odd years ago, and my, and my first program manager are both present in the audience today. So they are to blame, and afterwards, if there's any <laughs> ab ab abuse or criticism, I'll point you to these gentlemen, and they will help uh, absorb it. Energy. Energy is the currency. Energy is the most significant thing on this planet. With energy, you can have good health, uh, good lifestyle, food. You can have your transportation systems. Energy is clearly the most important currency of, the, of them all on this planet, far more significant than you know, banks and bankers and money and whatever. And if we want to continue to live with high standard of living and a, and a good environment, that energy has to be cleaner than the energy that we're harnessing uh, now. This is something that Barack Obama clearly uh, recognized. He hasn't recognized it quite to the point of offering me money to help solve the problem. <laughs> the world of condensed matter nuclear science. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about the terminology because it's confusing. Problems, progress, prospects, the general reactions. I'm going to teach you enough electrochemistry that you will be able to go home and do these experiments yourself, and I hope that you're encouraged to, to do so. Some unresolved uh, questions. All of these terms in red are used to describe what was announced on March 23rd, 1989 as cold fusion. The term cold fusion actually came from previous work in hot fusion, muon-catalyzed hot fusion. The term stuck, it's unfortunate, ir irritated the physicists. I think the physicists would have been irritated anyway, but this didn't help. In an attempt to soften the blow, we've called it low energy nuclear reactions or lattice enabled uh, nuclear reactions, LENR. Those are terms are not very good. Low is you know, sub subjective and pejorative, and we don't really want to produce low energy, and, and nuclear is always a bad word, and we took the <laughs> nuclear out of nuclear magnetic uh, resonance and called it magnetic resonance uh, imaging because sociologically nuclear is not a good term. Uh, chemically assisted nuclear reactions, the whole slew of things. The Japanese rather coyly called it new hydrogen energy, which really conceals a wealth under that uh, phrase. If we're talking about the, the Fleischmann-Pons effect, the effect that Martin Fleischmann and Stanley Pons announced to the world on March 23rd, which was the electrolytic production of excess energy from a cell containing heavy water, D2O, and a palladium uh, cathode, then the Fleischmann-Pons effect is uh, a, an accurate descriptor, descriptor, but the field has expanded vastly beyond that point. And, and we now have an over, overall um, terminology, condensed matter nuclear science, attempting to distinguish what we do from what uh, physicists, high energy physicists do with high energy particles or in high temperature uh, plasmas. Um, problems, the potential importance of energy, which I spoke to a little bit, it is very important. Uh, and anybody that makes claims about energy better be prepared to back them up with solid data. There was, because of that importance, a polarization of scientists at the beginning and some very uh, important, well-credentialed, apparently intelligent uh, people made some statements which are going to turn out to be just plain wrong. So. Uh, in order to um, secure their scientific credibility or at least not have it lapse before they die, there's a, there's a rear guard action against the advancement of this field just on the basis of scientific uh, credibility. In the beginning, the, the pioneers in the field did make a range of mistakes. Fleischmann and Pons made mistakes in respect to the gamma signal that they were or were not, were not seeing from their cells. So there have been a number of mistakes. And this is a field of huge technical complexity. I think of cold fusion as my second PhD. I've learned more in the pursuit of this field than I learned 
for in any other pursuit in my entire life. I had to learn whole new disciplines in order to, 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 to keep this thing moving forward. It's probably the greatest learning experience of my life if you, if you discount uh, child raising. <laughs> in the flows of money and information, you need a flow of money, you need a flow of information. In science, it's publications, it's, it's government grants, it's, it's a steady supply of money so that you can begin a research endeavor and, few, uh, and follow it to the end. There's been a, a great disruption of both the money flow and the flow of uh, scientific information through editors that have been become uh, polarized or very, very uh, cautious in acceptance of papers. So it really has not been easy. But it was a really big deal. March 19... March 23rd, 1989, a red letter day. And by May, Time Magazine, Newsweek, Business Week were all talking about it. It was uh, a time unlike any other that uh, I have experienced. I went to scientific uh, meetings where you couldn't get into the meeting rooms. The meeting rooms were crowded. People were fighting to get into the, to the uh, conference. I just, science was never like that before and has never really been like that uh, since it was the first thing that uh, motivated scientists to actually uh, physically engage themselves in, this, uh, in the study of this effect. It was truly extraordinary. And there are many, this field has generated <laughs> many cartoons, but some bright spark. It, it, what, what really happened was, a, like standing under here, and the chemist over here, I call all of, you, all of you chemists, I call all of you physicists and tell you to go at it. And the debate between chemists and physicists, chem chemical thought processes, physics uh, thought processes, really was endless and hasn't, con hasn't uh, stopped to this uh, day. And somebody suggested that perhaps we can get real energy out of cold fusion by putting chemists and physicists in front of a propeller-driven dynamo and power the light. Well, we can do better than that. So what's the, um, what's the contrast in a characteristic between hot fusion and cold fusion. These photographs were both taken, all three taken in 1989. We see uh, Martin Fleischmann, the father of this field, the uh, cleverest experimentalist I ever worked with. I went to do my postdoctoral <coughs> fellowship at Southampton specifically because it was the number one school of electrochemistry in the English-speaking world. And the reason for that was that Martin Fleischmann was there. Martin uh, was brilliant. Had anybody else made that announcement, by the way, I probably wouldn't have paid any attention to it, and I wouldn't have been here. The fact that it was Martin made me say, okay, I'll give this one a 50-50 shot. We converted $30,000 of my sponsor's uh, money to a three-month study to see whether this was uh, right or wrong. It was the first of my gross underestimates of the amount of money and the amount of time that this problem would take to solve. Um, but... Here's Martin Fleischmann and Sandy Pons holding their reactors. So in their hands, they have the reactor that is producing, in, in, in many cases, more energy in the way of heat out than the electrical power that's going into it. In contrast, we see the Tokamak fusion test reactor at uh, Princeton now closed down. It closed down in two, uh, 2000, no, 1997, like about nine years after this. But here you see the, the, the reactor holding the men rather than the men holding the reactor. And the scale difference is enormous. And to date, no hot fusion experiments has produced the gains, power out over power in, that many cold fusion experiments uh, produce more or less on a routine basis. So what's the problem with the experimental situation? If you view what Fleischmann and Pons denounced in terms of old science, old hot fusion science, which the view of um, interaction of nuclear uh, matter to cause a fusion largely derives from a, from a countryman, a fellow New Zealander, uh, Rutherford. So Rutherford, way back, had this view of balls banging into each other. And that view, supported by vast amount of experimentation, is well understood so that in terms of the pairwise interaction between two deuterium atoms or any other pairwise interaction, the physics is well understood. There's a theory. What we were doing 
clearly was in violation, whoops, clearly was in violation of that uh, theory. There was problems with reproducing the experiments so that we weren't even close. You know, if, if you thought that what we were doing was cold, hot fusion, then the physicist's argument was correct. It ain't happening, and it, it ain't happening. It didn't happen uh, that way. If, in, on the other hand, you start to think in terms of new science, you need to develop some new theory. The experiments are difficult. Yes, we need more experiments, but we are uh, generating new knowledge. So this is the you know, dichotomy like the physicists and the chemists on, on different sides of their propeller-driven machines. It's either one or the other, and I've got to tell you right now that I'm very uh, clearly in the camp of uh, new uh, knowledge is being developed. There is a new principle in physics which we're doing our very best to try and understand.